It's my pleasure to serve as your MC today. I'm, I'm on the board of SEI, and I've always been pleased to support this organization because of, I mean, to be honest, because of Dave and his heart for the community and the social networks. Uh, he gave me a book called Bowling Alone. He get, how many of y'all got that book from David? All right. <laughs> you know what it's talking about. And it is about that, about social connection, social network, and uh, making a change in our community. And I came about, uh, I was introduced through David when I went to the mayor of Woburn saying, I need to do, I want to do some good stuff here. He says, you need to connect with David. And when I connected, it was the start of a beautiful friendship. And so it's my pleasure to be here today. Today's event will feature the presentation of the 2023 SEI Idolist Awards. We're doing most of the official remarks up front at this time, early, to allow plenty of time for socializing and drinking while enjoying the refreshments, food, I mean. SCI is about, to culti is about cultivating connections after all. Before we go to the awards presentation, we're gonna take a few minutes to hear about SCI's mission and recent accomplishment. Let me welcome my dear friend, David Crowley, president and founder of SCI. David. Thank you, Mo, and thanks everyone for coming. Today, we're gathered to celebrate three amazing leaders, and we're very excited about that, and also to support the work SEI does to develop leadership in our communities. So before we get to those presentations, I want to share a little bit more about that work. On a rainy Saturday afternoon, back in early April, a little bit like today, Polly Kafui and I were the first ones to arrive at Microsoft Center in Cambridge for the Youth Grand Pitch Contest started out as pretty quiet as we unloaded all those boxes of supplies and food. You need a lot of food uh, for events, right? Uh, it was quiet there, but within about 30 or 40 minutes, Microsoft was buzzing with the energy of teenagers. If anybody has teenagers, uh, you know there's a lot of energy there, right? Uh, buzzing with teen eight teams of teens descended on Microsoft in Cambridge after working with coaches from the business community for six weeks to take a kernel of an idea for helping the community and fleshing that out into a full-blown plan that they were prepared to present and pitch to a panel of judges. So when they came and landed on Microsoft, there was a lot of energy and it was very exciting. They came up with ideas ranging, uh, as part of it, we always like to, you know, put decision-making and ideas into the community, and, and especially with young people, the ideas they come up with is great. I can't tell you all the ideas, they're on our website, but two examples. We had a team of teens from Chelsea that with their idea was to come up with a podcast to focus on bringing youth voice to the inequities in the educational system. We had a group from Dorchester that had a mental health focus, and they have a great idea, and we'll be soon coming to Dorchester, will be a great mural celebrating ideas for taking care of ourselves and promoting mental health and wellness in the community. Uh, so by the time the youth had done all their practicing with their judges and advisors and made their pitches to, it was a room actually bigger than this, uh, there to listen to these teens. The judges are so blown away, they figure out a way to fund all eight projects, and they're now busy implementing. So definitely, we'll have to send in our follow-up where that mural is going to be so you can check it out and the, the, the details on that podcast. So great stuff came out of that event. Just one example of how SEI develops leadership. Another example, you'll be hearing more about our AmeriCorps program later, so I don't want to steal those folks' thunder, but that is definitely a huge part of how SEI develops leadership is through our SEI AmeriCorps program. Three years ago, or actually two years ago, we started a new initiative focusing on vaccine equity and outreach to help make sure communities that were most hard hit by the pandemic really had the information they needed uh, about the vaccines. And the way we did that was training grassroots leaders to be educated themselves to then spread their word through peer networks. And that program is still going successfully. If a few of you I think I saw at this event last year might recall that I talked at that point about a young man named Josh Ortiz. Uh, he was one of the first ones to sign up for a program we, ha we have called Leaders for an Equitable Tomorrow, which focuses on youth mental health. 
Josh was very motivated, but alas, he had to move from Woburn to Billerica, uh, so we had, he wasn't able to be at all of our meetings. But he's the kind of kid, and we're the kind of organization that stays connected, even if you move technically out of our service area. So when one of our honorees, Michael Curry, invited our group of teens to provide some input to the governor, then governor-elect Healy, on the topic of youth mental health, Josh was jumping right in, you know, and of course it was virtual. I, yeah, we have a photo there. It's virtual, so it was easy. Uh, we didn't have to figure out how to get him from Bill Ricca to the meeting. Josh zoomed in and provided some great ideas, and it was really powerful to see the recommendations and insights young people had about mental health, and it did, and those recommendations did make it to the report that, the, that Michael's committee submitted. Uh, so an example of being able to really influence some change and po at a policy level. But going back to Josh, um, you know, I have actually known Josh since coaching him in Little League. Uh, so, but you know, sometimes, you know, you're just coaching somebody in Little League, you don't know the full story. Um, over the last year or two, when he's been involved in our leadership programs, I started getting a more full picture of Josh's background. And I am not gonna get into it here, but just let me say, it's, it's an amazing test to Josh's resilience that he, yeah, testing, hello? Okay. okay, all right. Somebody else has a, has a mic here? Okay, okay. Anyway, so Josh, we're going back to Josh. Uh, <laughs> so, so I started realizing that Josh really was, had really overcome some really tough challenges. And it's amazing because I happened to find out Josh is also a top-notch student as well as a dynamic leader. And he told me his goal was to be admitted to Harvard and go to school there which happens to be my alma mater. So it was time for me to leverage some social capital for Josh. And just a couple weeks ago, we went on a tour and, and we had a chance to sit down. There's Josh. Uh, we had a chance to sit down and with a dean, one of the deans who happened to be a classmate of mine. And that is, uh, I was not class of 1904, just to clarify. <laughs> That was FDR's room, actually, class of 94. We had some inside connections to get a tour of uh, where FDR spent his Harvard days. So uh, just, just in case you're wondering what year I graduated. Not 1994. I mean, not, 19, two, not 1904. Anyway, so Josh, you know, it's so great to see a kid like Josh having the opportunity to get those connections. Uh, and really, we're actually going to hear from Josh in a video a little later. I think you'll see why we're so excited to support Josh and so many young people like them pursue their, their dreams. You know, since the onset of the pandemic, as we all know, it really highlighted the inequalities and huge issues in our communities that most of us in the room were already all too well aware of, but it brought it more visible. And, it, and you know, when we think about our role at SCI, so much of it is about making the connections with young leaders and helping inspire them to take on those issues they see whether it's Josh and his peers working on youth mental health, or our SCI AmeriCorps members working to bring in more, young, more volunteers to support young people, or those kids in Chelsea really mobilizing youth voice uh, to change the educational system in their community. We believe helping train those young leaders and connecting them is crucial to addressing these issues in the future. So as we celebrate and gain inspiration for from three very well-established leaders tonight know that you are also supporting the development of many more leaders to come in behind them and share in this important work. So thank you for coming out tonight. Thank you, David. Now it's time to meet our 2023 SCI Idealist Award recipients. Please note, I will share a brief bio as I introduce them. And also, please look at your program book or our website for more inf information on these amazing individuals. Uh, stay tuned for a video we will share later with personal testimonials about their leadership from people that know them well. Our first idealist is my friend, my new friend, <laughs> Dr. Pam Ettinger. Uh, who is the president of Bunker Hill Community College, the largest of the 15 community colleges here in Massachusetts. Pam's service in the community college movement spans more than 25 years. Her tenure at BHCC in 2013 
and previously served as a president of Moore Park College in Southern California. She was saying her favorite place is San Diego. Uh, she earned her bachelor's degree in English from Barnard College and a master's and doctorate in Japanese literature from Columbia University. Pam serves on a number of boards and commissions, including the New England Commission of Higher Education, WGBH Boston, and the Boston Foundation, to name a few. President Ettinger was honored in 2016 by the Obama White House as a champion of change. Pam's tireless dedication to improving the lives of students, faculty, and staff at BHCC have made her a highly respected leader, positioning the college as a model for others. Her style is collaborative and results-oriented, and she has a deep passion for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Please join me in welcoming the 2023 SCI Idolist, Dr. Pam Edding. So this is the opportunity to hug like anybody and everybody. <laughs> I'm so thrilled to be here tonight and, and a little nervous because there's so many of you just looking at me and, and you're, I'm not on a stage and I can see you at eye level. Um, so I, I was asked to um, offer some remarks and I figured this is a good opportunity for me to talk a little bit about the community college movement. We are in such an amazing town of Boston where higher education is prized. Uh, internationally, people look at us and say, wow, look at what they're doing for colleges and universities. One day, my goal is for folks to say, wow, what are they doing for community colleges? And 50% of the undergraduates who go through our community colleges to blossom. In my mind, there is only one goal, is to lift every single one of my students to the middle class, period. Um, education is a tool for us to do that. And nationally, in the community college movement that began 100 years ago, there are 2,500 community colleges now. I would love to come up here and say, I'm just special, Bunker Hill is so special, but we're not special. We are, we are in some way a part of that 2,500 community colleges across the country. We're medium-sized, 16,000 students, and, um, and, and we're diverse. And, and frankly, um, all of our students come within 10 miles of the college on the Orange Line, which is anchored on one end with Bunker Hill, and on the other end with the wonderful Roxbury Community College, whose president, Jackie Jenkins Scott, is here today. <laughs> special we're special together um, because our students are not different they really are the same students um, a little bit about our students so I, I said that I have 16,000 students and um, the average age of our students is 26 I should have made you guess that that would have been fun oh, only a third of our students come right out of high school so you know Charlestown High School Brighton High School the high schools around our area the other the other two-thirds are adults they are four out of five are working, many of them full-time, many of them two jobs, many of them working for you, actually, in the city. And three out of five are parents. And half of those parents are single moms. So as, as I tell the story, I, I want you to really have a picture in your mind what kind of opportunity costs it will cost these students to actually come to me to better their lives to get into the middle class. And 77% of our students are living on the lowest two quintile of income. And I'll give you a comparison. Over at my, our, our neighbor, na neighboring Harvard and MIT, um, who are wonderful partners of ours, their students, 77% of them, are living at the top two quintile of income. But here's the magic. When they graduate from my place or Jackie's place, they flip two quintile into the middle class. And I can tell you that 
if higher education was ever magical. It is in the invention of the community college 100 years ago that made us what we are today. So why is it okay for us to leave 50% of our students behind? It's not. So I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about that. And which is not to say that our students don't come with challenges, right? The challenges that we in some way have created when we deep funded a lot of our communities that needed that funding. Um, the social network in our communities of color and our communities of poverty suck. And I would not use any other word than that because we have not been investing in it. So healthcare, K-12, transportation, housing, childcare, you know all of this. When, when, when COVID came, right, how many of those things actually were intact in our communities of Chelsea, of Everett, our gay cities in Malden, inner city Boston, right, where our immigrants come? I think there's probably about 50 to 60%, if not more, of immigrant and immigrant families in my, in my student population. And they are bilingual or emerging bilingual. They are gonna be the asset of tomorrow's society. Yet when we think about community college, what do you think about, right? All of the mythologies that are out there. And those mythologies is what I fight every day. And when I look to my colleagues like Jackie, we say, yeah, that's our job right, to eliminate poverty and generational poverty. So when, when I think about what it took to become this idealist that you seem to think I am. Um, you are. <laughs> I love you, Jackie. <laughs> you should see us in other venues. I mean, I think people walk around us. <laughs> Um, I am the daughter of, 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 well, I am immigrant and I, I'm the daughter of immigrant parents. I came from Hong Kong when I was 11 and my point of entry was Miami. And it was just now that I was talking to Roberto and he tells me that over 300,000 um, individuals actually came from Cuba in a very recent count. And, and they're coming in through, through the Southern border throughout the United States. But when I came, I was part of chain migration I was the 11 year old with two siblings and parents who were middle class in Hong Kong. When we stepped foot onto the United States, we knew we were blessed that we we're gonna have good education. But what my parents sacrificed was a middle class life for themselves. They put the children through college and all three of us were you know, typical immigrant children, right? Except I became a doctor, but not the kind that helps people. <laughs> is an engineer, but he's aerospace engineer, so he's not working, you know, on, on, on some project in, um, in, on, on the ground. And, and my sister, my sister's an artist. So, so somehow the immigrant dream got changed a little bit. Um, but it is because of their sacrifice that I'm standing here. So every time I look at a student at my college, I swore to myself that they will not go through what my parents went through. And Many of you are immigrants, you know what that means. They will not do what my dad did, which is to work as a waiter in a Chinese restaurant all his life. They will not do what my mom did, which was to take in garment work so she can be at home with the children when we came home. Um, they're immensely proud and they do have the immigrant spirit. But sometimes I think we romanticize what it means to have immigrant grit we romanticize what it means to pull yourself up by your bootstraps when you have no boots, right? We romanticize what it means to be in poverty and that meritocracy is all that means, um, that is all that needs. You can be very, very smart, like many of my students are. You can be very, very talented. That is evenly distributed across the nation and across populations, but opportunity is not. So I'm hoping that my idealism will help pull all of my students into the middle class. And I'm grateful that all of you are my partners because before I leave, all of you are gonna come and find out what kind of partnership you can have. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you uh, for honoring me tonight. And when I look at folks like Michael Curry um, and, um, and, and uh, Natasha, I am blessed to be in their company and they too will find that partnership before we leave tonight. Amen. So thank you very much, everyone.
Congratulations, Dr. Edinger. Thank you for your passion and compassion for education and for the people of Boston. Now I'd like to introduce SCI's Deputy Director, Philip Gordon, to come share a few words. Come on up, Phil. Thanks, Pastor Mo and Pam. That was really great. Um, I'm a son of immigrants, and I know firsthand the sacrifice that my parents made to get me here. So um, that means a lot to me. I'm um, not going to take up too much of your time, but um, I would just like to briefly kind of uh, tell you about our SEI AmeriCorps program before I introduce one of our members. Um, and I've been with SEI for almost four years now. I joined back in 2019 um, as the program director for our SEI AmeriCorps program. Um, I did not envision having to deal with the pandemic, but, um, and as tough as that was, it really, uh, it really forced us to, to rethink and change um, some of the things that we were doing and how we operated. So really um, over this last year, redesigned our program um, to really add more equity to our members and really help prepare them for um, not only success while they're with us, but success for the rest of their careers. Um, and we're really happy to announce a partnership with Merrimack College that's gonna enhance all of those things and really bring, um, I think, a level of uh, professional development that we haven't been able to offer our members before. Um, so I'm really excited about that. It just happened this week, so like, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Give it up. Um, and before I uh, introduce our members, our AmeriCorps program really focuses on supporting youth success and youth development. And we do that by placing members at other nonprofit organizations in Boston and the surrounding areas um, that really focus on engaging volunteers for youth enrichment programs, as well as um, running and facilitating those programs themselves. So it's a really, really unique program. We have some really great partners. Um, I'd love to tell you all about them, but for now, I'm gonna introduce Matt Brown, who is serving at the YMCA of Greater Boston on, on Huntington Ave. And, um, wow, it is a little, a little nerve wracking. Um, Thank you. Uh, once again, my name is Matt. Once again, my name is Matt. I might as well hold it. Um, <clears throat> September 3rd, 2022. I had butterflies. So many that I pictured myself floating away like the house from up. My car was packed to the brim with every inanimate object I placed sentimental value in. The weather was something you see in a concluding movie scene where the main character drives down a long, windy road in a red convertible wearing sunglasses, playing the Miami Vice theme song at full volume. I could feel the rising action of my own story becoming more apparent with every mile I trek closer to Boston. Prior to beginning my service term, I completed a gap year post-undergrad. During that time of abrupt change, I found comfort in music. It became clear to me the type of professional I wanted to be and how I wanted to contribute to the spaces I find myself in. In that Virginian summer, as I watched the last few shining weeks of my gap year dim, I made the decision to spend my time doing what fulfilled me. After a year spent in trial and error, I found the opportunity to chase that, uh, chase that fulfillment with SEI AmeriCorps and the YMCA of Greater Boston. I sat in my bedroom on the brink of a nervous sweat awaiting to be interviewed. I was then greeted by three smiling faces, two of which who are here tonight, uh, Julie Richmond, Becky Margali, and Eileen McNeil. With their enthusiasm beaming through Microsoft Teams, I felt my heart rate settle in a sigh of relief. After talking about my passion for music production, Julie made mention of a recording studio in need of a helping hand. My eyes grew to the size of stars, and within two weeks, I was in Boston trying to navigate public transportation for the first time. Settling into a new home is much more than unpacking boxes and moving furniture. It's about feeling like a part of the community. That acceptance and sense of belonging is invaluable. I went to nine different schools by the time I finished high school. I'd lived in five states by the time I graduated college. It's because of those vagabond-esque upbringing. It's because of that vagabond-esque upbringing. I feel comfortable navigating unfamiliar environments and seeking new challenges. I came to Boston with the intention to make that studio feel like home, not only for me, but for the youth who deserve access to it. During the first tour of my newfound oasis, the experienced green walls rushed my eyes and the moisture in the air was thick enough to smell. 
Attention-seeking dust mocked me with every surface I touched, but my smile could still span the Atlantic. Spaces like that are special. To have, to have a place to be yourself, free of judgment, is an invitation for personal growth and creativity. The giggle, the potential held inside of that small eight by eight foot room was evident, and I could only help but grin and giggle at the treasure I'd so graciously stumbled upon. It was a moment of realization to see the need to see the work that has to be done and to be prepared to do it. It was then that I set out to save the sound. My first pitch to the teens was lackluster to say the least. I stood in the middle of a handful of apathetic eyes who had heard one too many lectures that day. I told them about the program and my hopes to help them learn about music production. I wrapped up my spiel and turned over the hourglass to begin waiting for signups. A week went by and persisted. A week went a week went by and the wait persisted as the signups had yet to manifest. I started to reflect about where I went wrong. Was I not enthusiastic enough? Did some of the terminology not translate? Is the program not that interesting? Later, it struck me that most of the teens were seeing and meeting me for the first time. In order to really engage them and save the sound, I first needed to connect with them on an individual level. So I began supporting teen night programming Monday through Friday at the Huntington Ave and Roxbury YMCA's. It was then after consecutive days of being present, I heard a voice ask, hey, what was that studio thing you were talking about? My spurt could not be contained as the importance of building genuine relationships cast its light again. Even with all this new engagement, registration was still bleak and there was more to be done. And although I had no signups, I still went to the studio simply because I wouldn't rather be anywhere else. Hearing ambiguous sounds and random piano melodies ring out piqued the curiosity of the youth of the Roxbury, Roxbury Teen Center. One by one, they filed into the space to investigate what was going on. Moments later, there were two teams in the recording booth behind the mic, one playing electric bass and the other playing the keyboard. The room was filled with laughter and the same group of teens that had been so hesitant a few weeks ago had now let their guard down and replaced those, those defenses with fun and creativity. The life lessons have been abundant in this journey of a service term. I came to Boston in search of lending a helping hand, yet I never expected so many to return the favor. From the teens who brighten each day as they grow into young adults before my eyes, my SEI cohort and program directors who keep me motivated and lighthearted, to the YGB team that has been so encouraging and helpful during my tenure with AmeriCorps, every one of you have been integral in making this service term a success. I was always taught that every story had a beginning, middle, and end. However, even as my service term expires, what I gave back won't. So with the weather warming and new destinations in mind, I'll keep my foot on the gas and continue down this windy road, knowing that the destination was never a place, but a feeling. Thank you, Matthew, for that great testimony and your service to AmeriCorps. Thank you. Good things ahead. Good things ahead. Look forward. Man, so our next idolist brings a deep passion for grassroots organizations and over 20 years of nonprofit experience in a role as executive director to the Boston Women's Fund. In this role, Natanya Craig Okendo hope I pronounced that correctly. Okay, thank you. Somebody was laughing, I don't know, sorry. <laughs> Works in partnership with full diversity of our communities, particularly women, girls, gender expansive people of color, and LGBTQIA plus community to build a better future for everyone. Prior to her current role, Natanya used her grit, passion, personal life experience to build Boston Foundation's grassroots strategy. She has also held positions with the Possible Project, Fidelity Investments, Partnership Inc., the Urban League of Eastern Massachusetts. She's on the board of Philanthropy Massachusetts and the Harvard Phillips Brooks House. Natanya believes in philanthropy that seeks out leaders making positive changes in their communities and centers their knowledge, expertise, and solutions. At the core of her work is the concept, do nothing about me without me. So please join me together in welcoming the 2023 SCI Idolist, Natanya Craig Okendo.
Wow, what an honor. Um, there's so many people I love in this room. So just because we're, we're, it's, it's about social capital, so I'm just going to shout out a few people, OK? Um, so first of all, good evening. Um, my name is a mouthful, which is why we're all laughing. So it is, it's Natanya, Craig, or Kendall. It's a lot to say. Um, but first, I want to stop by thinking my family. Um, my, my oldest daughter is here, Samantha, and then my favorite grandchild, Miss Mila. Um, so my social capital is right here. But I also want to shout out the Perrys, Jennifer Aronson, Jackie Jenkins Scott, who was the interim before me. And when I said, how am I going to fill your shoes? She said, you don't have to worry about filling my shoes. I'm going to teach you how to tie your own. She's such an incredible leader. Uh, but Pam gave her a lot of praise, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going. Um, <laughs> you deserve it. My sisters, Cindy and Patricia, um, and then my colleagues who are in the room, Jessica, Samaya, Michael, and Pam. I feel like I'm amongst royalty. So thank you so, so much for having me here tonight. Um, so many of SEI's values align with core beliefs we hold at the Boston Women's Fund. Their dedication to responding to the needs of the community, strengthening young leaders, and believing in the truth that what we can do together always surpasses what we can accomplish alone. Boston Women's Fund is the oldest women's fund in Massachusetts, and we like to say that we are a people first fund. I give great thanks to our founding mothers of our organization who gathered at a community meeting nearly 40 years ago and bravely started something new with the understanding and lived experience that mainstream philanthropy could not do more could do more to support black and brown women, girls, and folks in the LGBTQIA plus community. As one of our founders said, Jean Antine, many funds begin with their donors or donors or donor base. We began with our beliefs. The belief that financial resources are crucial in building movements and creating systemic change and that financial resources are not more crucial than the people themselves. We believe the fuel is in the resilience and courage of our people who are organizing, ed educating, reimagining, innovating, disrupting, building, fighting, and showing up to support families where they're at, because oftentimes that's where they come from too. In my personal experience in philanthropy, I witnessed a sector that moves at a pace that dismisses the urgency of the very real challenges people are people are facing on the ground, the urgency of being under-resourced, living, living in food deserts, being discriminated against due to your sexual orientation or because you're black or brown or refugee or immigrant or simply a woman or even a young person or an elder. I've seen a sector that has commissioned reports when we already know the analysis, a sector that continues to extract data from through evaluating communities before taking action or committing to that community. I've come to imagine and hopefully shape a sector that listens that trust and respects the work that our community leaders are already doing. Incredible work that's been done without the resources that they deserve. We would deepen our understanding tenfold and move at a much swifter pace, I believe. What SEI and the Boston Women's Fund know is that when we have the courage to cast convention aside and start centering people over resources, we in fact start moving towards justice. I'm a firm believer that the movements led by the people are the pathway to freedom from oppression. SEI's tagline, cultivating connections, gets at the heart of what strong movements require. Dedicated, united people marching to the beat of the same drum with a passion for the same cause in the name of freedom. I wanna thank SEI for creating a space for leaders like myself, unlikely leaders who grew up in Villa Victoria had a beautiful daughter at 15, did not go to college, was housing insecure, was poor, but I moved up to middle class. I just want you to know that, Pam. I find myself here along with so many others before me who are willing to reimagine what justice looks like, what liberation feels like, and what community-centered change could really be. I could not do that without the brave leadership of our chair, Akosia. Thank you so much. And thank you all so much for honoring, honoring me tonight. And thank you for your leadership and passion for the work. 
Now I'd like to introduce SCI's board chair, Jennifer Baker Jones, to share about how you can help SCI to continue developing leaders and cultivating community connections. Welcome, Jen. Thank you, Mo. And um, really, to come after these two amazing award recipients, uh, congratulations. And um, it's this is what we're all about. Um, as you may know, the Connect and Inspire series is our biggest fundraiser of the year for SCI. Your donations to SCI help us carry out our mission. We came to this event having raised over $60,000 thanks to our generous sponsors. On behalf of the SCI board, let me say a huge thank you to all of our sponsors. And I'd like to give a special thank you to our gold sponsors, Eastern Bank, Liberty Mutual, and Cummings Properties. I'd also like to acknowledge some of the um, officials that are joining us this evening. Uh, State Senator Cindy Friedman, uh, Boston City Councilor at Large, Julia Mejia, and Director of AmeriCorps for the Mass Service Alliance, Susanna Kantardich. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and hearing more about FBI. At part one of this series, we announced our goal of raising an additional $15,000 uh, during these two events. Um, to this point, we are off to a great start, having raised um, nearly half of that, uh, or uh, a third of that, I should say, uh, uh, $5,700 at our first event. Um, so we're looking to raise the remainder of that about uh, $9,217 to be exact um, at this evening's event. So we'd like to ask you to, to join us in helping make that happen. Uh, to make your donation to support SCI and our AmeriCorps members and all of the work that SCI is doing, um, you can get your phone ready and you can see that we, we've put it on all of our slides tonight. So we've been dropping a hint all evening. So you can join us now in, in uh, fulfilling that. Uh, you can send a text message to SCI 2023 to 50155 and just follow the prompts and make your pledge amount and uh, you can complete the pledge tonight or you can do it sometime in the future because you'll get a reminder. It's a really good system like that. So don't worry about it. You can still socialize with everybody and, and be friendly and everything. And you can put that credit card in later on. Um, but uh, we'll be back later this evening with an update on, on how we've done. And uh, But we really hope that, that you'll consider uh, take into account everything that you've heard about SCI tonight um, and the experience of AmeriCorps members like Matt and uh, join us in supporting all of the, the work and the mission of SCI. So I'm going to pass it uh, back to Mo so we can continue with the rest of our program. Thank you, Jennifer. And thanks to all that I see sending in a pledge right now. Now it's, the, now it's our time to meet our third and final 2023 SCI idealist. Our final idealist to meet is Dr. Michael Curry, Esquire. And I heard Michael at the Juneteenth event last year. Uh, he gave us a word of encouragement, and I still remember that. He serves as the president and CEO of Massachusetts League of Community Health Centers, which represents 52 healthcare centers, health centers that serve over 1 million patients. Michael brings over 25 years of experience and result in civil rights advocacy, health reform, and health equity, including service to the NAACP National Board. This experience positioned him to provide crucial leadership when the COVID-19 pandemic hit. He co-chaired the legislatively, excuse me, created Health Equity Task Force <clears throat> aimed at addressing the health disparities that have been magnified by this pandemic. He served on numerous committee, uh, committees responding to the crisis, including the governor's COVID-19 vaccine work group. He was named Bostonian of the Year 2021 by the Boston Globe and the Boston Magazine in recognition of this important leadership. More recently, Michael co-led an effort to organize Black and Latinx, Latinx leaders in health in Massachusetts to launch a health equity compact 
aimed at eliminating health disparities in Massachusetts through an omnibus health equity reform proposal. So please join me in welcoming the 2023 SCI Idolist, Dr. Michael Curry. There is so much I want to say, but we don't have the time to do that. Um, I probably would start here. Um, there's an African proverb that I love. It says, um, if you know the beginning well, the end won't trouble you. So the beginning for me is my mother in the back of the room. And I don't know why, every time I mention her name in public, I choke up, I don't know what that is. Um, I think about the fact that she was a single mom in Alabama who, or oh, did Alabama know her? Who um, wanted the warmth of other sons and like six million other folks left the South and moved North for jobs and opportunity and knew no one in Boston and came here to do domestic work. So when I think about an idealist, I think about people who are really thinking outside the box. They're doing things that are not really practical, that you move somewhere without a family, a social uh, a network of folks to take care of you, maybe even without a safety net, because you want to create a better life for your family. She moved here by herself and later sent for her children. And I was born here. And we were born, I was born in the projects. And you know, it's so funny when I'm around a lot of other people to say, Michael, why do you always mention you were born and raised in the projects? And I'll leave, I, I share with you another quote by Frederick Douglass, who said, it's not just the height you reach, but the depths from which you come. So I share that today when I think about the work that SCI does and the communities that I come from. I think about the fact that I, many years in Jackie Jenkins Scott, who, um, you know, such a fan of, of the work that she's accomplished and continues to accomplish in her career. And I think about being a kid at Whittier Street Health Center. I got my care at the health center. Um, I later got my care at Roxbury Comprehensive Health Center. We moved further up on uh, Warren Street. And it was a pla place that we got our teeth and our eyes and our mental health. Uh, my sister was addicted to, uh, to crack at the time. Uh, got services. Uh, I think about all the things that that health center provided for my family. And even if we were food insecure, you can go get a meal at the health center. So it is an honor many years later to come back and represent community health. Center. I don't know why I'm choking up right now. <laughs> Sorry. <about that>. Um, <laughs> an honor to represent community health centers. Um, the work of racial justice, health equity is a hard one. Um, I often say, I'm glad so many people are woke and others are waking up, but some of us are insomniacs. Cindy Friedman is an insomniac. Jackie Jenkins Scott is an insomniac. Pam is an insomniac. Natanya is an insomniac. That means way before George Floyd, way before COVID-19, Folks were in the room raising the equity hand, challenging people to do the right thing and nobody, or at least most people weren't listening. And it meant you probably didn't get invited back. It meant that you were probably thought of in a, in a bad way that this person is disruptive and always brings up things that nobody wants to hear. So I appreciate the insomniacs that I get a chance to work with. I had a chance, of course, I've known Senator Friedman for many years, but I got a chance to work with her on the COVID vaccine working group and Liz Walker and Wanda McLean and, and now the head of the CDC, Rochelle Walensky. And I always say that work of equity is hard because oftentimes when you raise that hand, you're the skunk in the party. And we were in those rooms, those virtual rooms, uh, Chair Friedman, with really smart people 
right? We're talking epidemiologists, doctors with all kind of uh, national and world acclaim for the work that they've done. And we had to say, well, wait a minute, um, that's not equity. Don't relegate black and brown communities to Johnson & Johnson and they don't have access to Pfizer and Moderna because that's not what equity is. Or if you're going to put the vaccines out and you're gonna start with certain demographics, you just told me that people who are black and brown are dying in their 40s and 50s. So make sure that we get to the vaccine for those populations sooner. But that was hard because people push back. Equity is always competing with costs. We can't afford it. It's not convenient. It's not efficient. So I say that to all of you in the room who are willing and bold enough to be idealists and disruptors, to be that person in the room, that we need more of you. Because there's, there's a risk that comes with doing it. I'll, I'll end it on this, and of course, to David and the SCI team, so thank you so much for honoring me along with um, two people that I'm a huge fan of the work that they do and allies in this work. Um, I am passionate around health equity because I really feel that, quite frankly, we've gotten weathered to higher rates of disease and death in black and brown and poor communities. And when I say weathered, of course, there's a now a national conversation of weathering. Geronimus, the researcher, looked at women's fertility and looked at black women's fertility and found that contrary to opinion at the time, the safest period of time for black women to have a baby was during her teenage years. The time, at the time, they thought that one of the reasons maternal death and bad outcomes were so bad because black women were, were Natanya, having babies at young ages. But Geronimus actually in her research proved that actually wasn't the case. It was the weathering over their 20s and 30s that made their pregnancies more risky. It was racism, it was trauma, it was poverty. It was all these social determinants of health that made their babies die. And in many cases, those black mothers die. But I wanna share and leave you with this. That wasn't the example that was shared with me. I think it was Healthcare for All that did this presentation many years ago, and they used the example of asthma which I had asthma, my mother had asthma, my little sister had asthma. And they asked black women to rate their kids asthma from one to 10, and many of those mothers in that study rated their kids asthma as three, fours, and fives. Then the doctors came in and evaluated those same kids, and they were eight, nines, and tens. And the researchers that presented us in Healthcare for All said, well, that's weathering, because you can get so used to taking the allopent and Flovent like I did two, three times a day, like my mother and my sister did, or you can get so used to sitting at Boston City Hospital as I did once a month or once a quarter that you get weathered to being sick. So I always ask the question, what are you weathered to? Are you weathered to some communities that we're, we're right now in Boston, they're living with shootings and drive-bys and deaths in their communities and we've gotten used to it? Or where if you live in communities like I grew up in, they live five and 10 years less than most Americans, most Bostonians, because they're gone too soon of almost every disease I can name. Are you weathered to the fact that black women in this room right now, we're celebrating women are living longer with breast cancer, but that's not true for you black women in this room. So I challenge you as we celebrate SCI and the work that they do and the phenomenal work they do with young people and the phenomenal work they're doing in our communities, how do you unweather yourself? because that's the challenge. How do you now become uncomfortable with the conditions that too many of our neighbors face around us? And I'm honored to do that work with some amazing people. Thank you. Congratulations, Michael, and thank you for all the amazing work you do to promote health, equitable, and equitable communities.